Hi, good afternoon. Happy Valentine's Day. I'm Michelle Grizoulis, president of the Foundations at Rochester Regional Health, and I'm happy to be here and joined today by Dr. Scott Fitel, who is the director of heart failure at the Sands Constellation Heart Institute at Rochester Regional Health. And as you know, we've been talking about hearts and cardiology and all good things heart this month. And so today we're going to talk about heart failure and some of the advancements and the way that cardiologists are taking care of heart failure. So that's what Scott's here to talk about. So thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Happy to have you here. So I'd like to invite all of you listening to ask questions. If you have a question, please type it in the comments section and we will periodically stop and answer those questions. So let's get started. Sure. So in simple terms, for us lay people who aren't doctors, tell, tell us how our hearts work. Sure. Uh, so the most basic way to think about it is the heart is a pump. And so it's divided into two sides, the left side and the right side. And so the left side pumps blood to the whole body so that the body can get nutrients, pick up oxygen, um, and pick up the carbon dioxide, the leftover waste, uh, and bring it back. And then the right side of the heart has the blood returned from it after it's been used. And so the right side of the heart then pumps the blood into the lungs. And so that's your basic circuit. Um, and so any number of things can obviously go wrong that make that circuit not work well. Uh, but in as basic terms as possible, that's the nuts and bolts of it is pumping blood. Great. So I often think of it too as it's a muscle, but it's got a lot of electrical currents that kind of keep it on track as well. Correct. So just like a car or your house or anything that has moving parts or a fish tank pump is a good analogy, um, you need electrical current to make things work and the heart's no different. So in order for the muscles to actually contract, um, there needs to be an electrical signal that triggers them and once they reach that action potential, the actual electrical signal hits it, it knows to contract and that's how you get pumping. Okay. So before we go deep on a couple things, Describe for us what is considered heart failure. What does that mean when someone says, says I'm in heart failure, or you say someone's in heart failure? Sure, definitely the worst marketing term ever. Everybody hates <laughs> seeing me because they're on the heart failure guy. Um, but the reality is, is that um, heart failure is basically means that the, uh, the heart is unable to maintain enough pump function to supply the body with blood. And that could be for, again, for any number of reasons. It could be because of the left side of the heart. It could be because of the right side of the heart. It could be one of the valves is not working well. It could be the electrical system not working. But for whatever reason, the body's not getting the blood supply that it wants, and the heart's unable to fulfill its needs. So there's really degrees of heart failure mm -hmm. from what you've just described, right? Correct. Yep. Degrees, uh, varying severities um, from very mild cases that have hopefully not too many long-term ramifications to some of the most life-threatening severe diseases known to medicine um, that need emergent uh, care. Okay. So describe for our listeners today, what are some of the symptoms of heart failure that we might encounter as we go through our lives. Sure, and I, anytime I, I get asked this question, I always give a little caveat that there's a lot of other things that cause these symptoms, so I don't want someone to panic if they're out there listening and they, and they hear it and say, oh my God, this is what I have. Always seek medical, uh, get medical attention That's immediately. That's a good disclaimer. Period. Absolutely. Um, but generally speaking, people with heart failure, so shortness of breath is about probably the most common complaint that we hear and the most limiting. Um, and again, this can be a very mild form where you just get a little winded doing uh, extraneous activities to the point where you can't even do your laundry or take a shower without getting very short of breath. Wow. Um, rarely are the symptoms at rest, but it can be. Um, the other thing is that because the heart is not pumping and blood is what get, it gets pumped, it's, very, it's not uncommon for people to have fluids uh, build up, so swelling and edema. Um, and that swelling and edema can be in the legs, it can be in the belly, and it can even be in the lungs, which is what makes someone short of breath. Are there, we talked last week um, about women's heart health, and I'm wondering, are there different, different symptoms that manifest themselves uh, in women versus men sure. with heart failure? So uh, that is actually very common in a lot of other cardiac diseases. I think Dr. Chowdhury had a good discussion mm -hmm. on that. Um, but one of the, you know, in heart failure, it's, it's all lead to the final common pathway, which is these symptoms. So regardless of the etiology of it, and women are at more risk for certain types of heart failure compared to uh, men, um, but ultimately the symptoms manifest themselves pretty much the same way with shortness of breath, leg swelling, um, palpitations can happen, um, people can experience chest pain with heart failure, that, that is possible. So all those symptoms generally are felt pretty across the board regardless. And we'll talk in a minute about what, some, what you would suggest someone does in terms of good cardiac health, but talk to us a little bit about the risk factors for heart failure, I guess, is the right way to say it. Sure. Um, so heart failure is taking it one much further than the typical stuff you think about with heart disease. So a lot of people think of heart attacks, chest pain, that kind of stuff. Um, and sometimes people have a heart attack and it weakens the heart muscle so bad that they end up in heart failure. And so a lot of the similar, uh, very overlapping uh, risk factors that you associate with heart attacks. So smoking, uh, poor quality uh, diet, eating hot foods that are very high in uh, uh, saturated fats as well as uh, carbohydrates. 
Um, and then there are certain health factor risks that predispose you to heart failure. So having underlying heart disease, i.e. heart attacks in the past or blockages in your arteries. Um, other organs that get sick can lead to heart getting sick, so kidney disease is one that's often under-recognized, but people with kidney disease are at much higher risk of developing both heart disease caused by heart attacks and also heart failure. Um, and then other unhealthy lifestyles, again, we talked about smoking, sedentary lifestyle, um, family history unfortunately plays a big role, which we have no control over, but genetics can play a role. Okay. That's helpful. Um, I'm going to pause for a second and introduce for people that might have just joined. I'm Michelle Grizoulis, and I'm joined today by Dr. Scott Fitel, who is Director of Heart Failure at the Sands Constellation Heart Institute, and we're talking about heart failure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the technology. I know we've done a lot in the last year uh, and in the last couple of years regarding technology advancements in cardiac care. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about that and sure. in particular any treatment protocols that we use or things that you focus on in your practice. Sure. I, this is one of the reasons I'm, luckily I'm still, I could say I'm a relatively young doctor and I, I get to brag about that a little bit to some of my peers. Um, but one of the most exciting reasons what got me into this field is really the, the advancements that have taken place in, the, in a very short period of time. So if you look at the trajectory of heart failure, not much had changed from the late 90s to the almost 2010, 2012. And really in the last four or five years, there's been just an onslaught of new data, new data suggesting that there are better ways to treat patients. Um, so there are newer medicines that got FDA approval in the last couple of years that have improved survival and reduced hospitalizations by quite a bit. Um, and then we are also, uh, look, I'd like to say we're at the cutting edge here at RGH, at Rochester General, uh, because there are new procedures that we do that actually have helped patients tremendously. Um, we are uh, I'm a big believer in something called a cardiomems implant, which is literally a little tiny implant that goes inside someone's lung that uh, gave me the, gives me insight into their disease much more so uh, than I can have outside of them being outside an ICU. So this little implant actually gives me the pressure tracings of what's going on inside their heart and lungs. Say what that's called again? Uh, it's called a cardiomems, an implantable pulmonary artery monitor sensor. Okay. And basically it's a little tiny implant with no moving parts, no batteries, nothing that wears out, and it sits inside the lung. Um, it sits there passively. It really has very little side effect profile. And what it does is it gives me the data that I would only other be able to have is someone in an ICU with a special catheter in their neck. And until this device, we had no other way of recording what was going on inside the heart uh, without this device. So much less invasive. Much less invasive. People can be at home and they actually go home with a fancy pillow and they lay down on the pillow for about 20 seconds. Uh, and it gives me a whole host of information about what's going on inside their yeah. heart. And it really allows us to tailor medicine to individuals. So rather than doing cookbook medicine where everybody gets the same drug, I can actually look at the pressure tracing each morning in my email inbox and either me or one of my outstanding uh, uh, physician assistants, uh, Katrina and Trish, can call the patient up and say, hey, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Jones, um, your readings are up. What did you eat last night? Or what did, you know, did you skip a dose of medicine? It actually allows us to give us insight into their disease. And again, we can really tailor their therapies to keep them optimized and keep them out of the hospital. It's pretty impressive. It's really impressive. It's really impressive. What's on the horizon that you're working on in the heart failure space? Sure. So uh, I'm also a big believer in research, trying to give access to patients uh, to care that we wouldn't have available for another few years. And so we're launched, we've done several phase three clinical trials uh, at Sands Constellation um, for patients with heart failure. Uh, some of them are drugs that are already FDA approved, but with additional indications that we're looking at. Um, and some are novel agents that aren't yet available. Um, we are also introducing something called a sensible medical vest, which is kind of like a cardiomems. It helps us assess volume status in the patient. Something. Let me actually just pause though. Phil, are there any questions that have come in? Yeah, there's a, um, a lot of talk about diet. Um, some people say Mediterranean, some people say low sodium diet. Uh, is there one diet that you recommend after heart failure? Sure. Uh, prior to? So I'll answer both of those. So prior to, I'm a big advocate of actually the Mediterranean diet. So Mediterranean diet, for those who are not familiar, med it's what people eat that live in the nice, beautiful, sunny areas <laughs> of the Mediterranean. Um, and so it's a uh, diet that consists of uh, high in uh, certain fats and oils that are healthy. So olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. Um, it's picking the right kind of protein sources. So uh, fresh fish and even some chicken is okay, but avoiding red meat. And then really focusing on fresh vegetable, legumes, beans, things like that have been proven to be very beneficial in the prevention of cardiac disease. Once you have heart, the diagnosis of heart failure, I still encourage that diet because it's an overall healthy diet. Uh, but then we have the added bonus of restricting salt. So salt causes fluid retention mm -hmm. in heart failure. Yeah. And so patients that have heart failure and the heart can't pump the blood enough, we have to do everything in our power to prevent fluid from building up. Um, and so low salt diet is very beneficial uh, and can help people come from ending up in the hospital. So as I listen to you, one of the things that I'm struck by, you started by saying at the beginning that you hate, and not hate, but that you find that, that calling something heart failure can be very off-putting. What I really hear you describing is that what you really focus on is ways to properly identify and diagnose cardiac issues by 
treating and preventing early, mm -hmm. and surgery isn't necessarily a necessary and always an outcome, that many people yeah. are able to treat it through modifying. Sure, protocols. yes. So the, uh, heart failure is an umbrella term that encompasses a lot of diseases, and for certain types of disease, there is no option but surgery. So if you have an aortic valve that's very stenosed, which means it's very tight, there's very little I can do with medicines. You need a, either surgery or an interventional procedure in the cath lab to fix it. Same with multiple blockages in the arteries. Sometimes you need a bypass surgery or a lot of stents to be able to repair that damage. Um, but if once that's been fixed or if we've ruled out those as etiologies of your heart failure, um, most of what I do is really managing medicines, titrating mm -hmm. medicines, and using some of the newer agents and, and technologies that we have to manage people and keep them out of the hospital. Um, and I, I tease my patients, and my patients tease me, that as we, we don't look at it as a heart failure team. We look at it as a heart success team. Yeah, yeah. Um, we really want to make patients live a nice, long life, uh, a healthy life. Uh, and have, be, have quality time with their friends and family and not be trapped in a hospital. We also call the director of preventing heart failure. There you go. Um, so I know that we're fortunate enough to have developed some wonderful collaborative partnerships. Uh, I, two come to mind for me, Westchester Medical Center and the Cleveland Clinic. Can you share with the audience a little bit about some of the partnerships and collaborations that we have with the SAMS Constellation Heart Institute? Sure, yeah. I mean, even though some way look at a map, myself being from uh, North Jersey uh, originally, would say that Rochester is a little bit geographically isolated, and it is, but luckily within a short period of driving, uh, there's a lot of regional uh, powerhouses in cardiology. Cleveland Clinic is a no-brainer. That's where I did my uh, training for advanced heart failure. Um, it's really the number one institute in the world for cardiac care. And so uh, sometimes if I get a case that I'm a little stumped on or if I need a little help or if it's something that's beyond the scope of something that can be managed uh, locally in Rochester, we may transfer a patient out to Cleveland Clinic to get a second opinion or to pursue some kind of advanced therapy like a mechanical heart pump or even a heart transplant if, if all else fails. Um, and the same goes for some of our partners downstate, uh, Westchester Medical Center and even NYU. Um, they have robust programs with a lot of smart people, and luckily I know all of them. And uh, so, you know, if we ever get into a situation where we need something that's beyond the scope or purview that can be done here, or if there's a reason that somebody may want to travel, um, I get on the phone and I call them. And we've had several patients transplanted and had uh, something called an LVAD, a mechanical heart mm -hmm. pump, um, that the patients can get uh, if they need it. Uh, very easy to arrange uh, if, the, if the circumstances are right for that patient. Define for the audience what LVAD means. Oh, sure. So uh, LVAD is a left ventricular assist device. And so sometimes, even though I try to be ever the optimist and we have a lot of good tools in our belt, uh, sometimes the left ventricle is just too sick. It literally, despite our best efforts, will not pump enough blood. Um, and there may be a reason that someone is not a transplant candidate, or more realistically, in the modern era, the wait times for organs is just very, very long. Um, I'll take a little sidetrack here. If you're not an organ donor, I strongly encourage everyone to become organ donors. Let your friends and family know that you are an organ donor. Um, it's one of the best gifts you can give at a time of crisis and, and trouble and, and uh, depression and bad things happening in the family. Uh, being able to be, give the gift of life to someone is, a, is something that shouldn't be taken lightly, but I would advocate for. But that being said, there still is a critical shortage of organs in this country. Patients die on the wait list all the time. And so the LVAD, the left ventricular assist device, is a special pump that we can actually implant uh, in the heart um, and can actually help patients uh, live outside the hospital. Uh, there are some caveats to it. They have to have batteries that are external to them. Um, okay. But again, they can have a very good quiet life. I've had patients that have traveled freely, gone overseas. Um, I had a, one of my favorite stories, I had a patient once uh, that never bowled, he was an avid bowler, but never got a 300 game, and we put the LVAD in him, and he got his 300 game. Look and, at uh, that. He was very proud of that, and I was too. That's great. That's great. Uh, I, have, I have a couple other questions, but sure. I want to just check. Phil, any additional questions? Yeah, can you talk about um, some of the resources that are available to families that may have someone who's going through heart failure when they're in the hospital, um, just families are spending a lot of time there? Sure. Yeah, it can be a very trying time and uh, very emotionally draining for everyone involved. We are actually in the process, I don't have it up and running yet, but we're actually looking uh, at developing a uh, heart failure, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Resource? Uh, like a, a support group, uh, not anything, oh. a support group. We're actually in the process of developing a heart failure support group for family members, uh, for family that have uh, people afflicted with this that need the extra help. That's great. Um, the other thing I always encourage, especially if they're hospitalized, is our palliative care team provides excellent support and has a lot of access to resources for family members. So uh, if they are hospitalized and 
either something simple like a chaplain service or if you just need a, a shoulder to cry on. It's, and certainly I like to think I do a good job at that, but sometimes a little extra help is needed. Um, so I usually encourage anybody with living with heart failure to meet the palliative care team. People have this negative connotation that it means hospice. It really doesn't. They provide a lot of other services. If there are little kids involved, they actually have a special service for little children that helps explain it to a little child uh, that may not have the understanding of why daddy's so sick or why mommy's not doing well or why grandma can't leave the hospital. Um, so that's one of the resources we tap into a lot. So Scott, if somebody is a patient today of yours or a patient at the Heart Institute and wants some of those resources, what's the best thing they should do? Reach out to their provider and ask for resource support? And they sure. can be connected that way? Absolutely, okay. yeah. Um, okay. Most of the docs and our doctors in our program uh, can arrange those things and ultimately that most of them know how to find me and we can usually make some phone calls and, and get the support needed. Um, and there are a lot of community access uh, programs and things that we can do for support groups for people that are just sick in general, not just heart failure. Um, and then ultimately, uh, I always encourage uh, reaching out to organizations like the American Heart Association. Mm -hmm. um, There's some great uh, resources on their website and some numbers that you can call and things you can read through to get some more information about the disease that can help. That's great. So what's the favorite part of your job? What do you love most about what you do? <laughs> um, I, oh, that's a no-brainer. I mean, the fa it, it is amazing that in the modern era in particular that you can take someone who can get so sick and be the sickest patient in our ICU setting, and within a matter of a couple days or a couple of weeks, they actually have the ability to walk out of the hospital. That's amazing. Um, it really is absolutely incredible. Um, it, there's no, no greater feeling in the world than seeing someone that was that sick and then walking out with their bouquet of balloons and some flowers in their hand and actually walking to their door of their car. It's amazing. We're fortunate as a community to have the resources that we have at the Sands Constellation Heart Institute. Absolutely. Uh, very proud of. Yeah, very proud of uh, what this uh, institute does and what the hospital does to support our patients is absolutely unbelievable. Um, I'm very happy to be here. So what's your advice to patients? You know, oftentimes when we have these chats, people will say, okay, make sure you see your provider once a year, or this seems to me like this is going to manifest itself in a way where it's going to force you into some, it's going to force sure. you into care more than it's, you know, yeah, well, one way or another, you will be seen by a doctor, whether it's under your own terms or not. So I usually encourage patients, uh, particularly the more <clears throat> stubborn, and I pick on the guys here not being sexist, but sometimes guys are a little more stubborn about these things. And what I always tell patients is don't ignore symptoms. Not being able to walk up a flight of stairs is not normal. Not being able to go grocery shopping is not normal. And so it may not be heart failure. It may be an asthma attack that you don't realize you have uh, adult onset asthma. Um, or there may be some COPD, or there's a million other things it could be, but just seek medical attention, um, go to an urgent care site, go to your primary care doctor, find an, a primary care doctor, it's pretty easy to get plugged in. Um, and a lot of times it doesn't require a lot of invasive testing, just some simple tests, some blood work, and you know maybe an x-ray and an, and an ultrasound of your heart or an EKG can really lay out what the diagnosis is and how to treat it. Well, and it's, as I listen to you, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things I'm struck by is I think it would, like most things, it would be easy to become overwhelmed by what you think are potential terrible outcomes from minor symptoms or major symptoms. But your point is go get help because it doesn't necessarily mean that your lifestyle is going to diminish, you could feel better. Absolutely, yeah. A heart failure is not a death sentence as are most diseases in the modern era. They really aren't death sentences. There's a lot we can do to treat them. Um, and really improve quality of life tremendously. So don't be afraid just because you're afraid of what you may find out. Um, and I always throw this as a caveat too, just be careful what you read on Google. Um, there's a lot of information. Some of it's fantastic, good information, but some of it's not reputable or hasn't been vetted very well. Um, and it may be someone that's disgruntled or doesn't know. Um, and so rather than jumping to conclusions or worrying, just go see a primary care doctor. A quick 20, 30 minute visit can really shed some light on, the inf on this, what the issue is and give you the right, uh, send you on the right path. That's very helpful advice for those of us who Google search most things. Sure. Phil, any questions that have come in? We're good? Okay. So anything else that I didn't mention or ask that you want to share with the audience about our program or heart failure? Um, no, I would just say, uh, again, focusing on prevention is, uh, you know, simple steps like quitting smoking or improving your diet a little bit can help tremendously. And not being afraid when symptoms arise. Don't wait till the, you're, uh, you know, you're, you have to call 911 at 3 a.m. because you can't breathe. Um, if you have mild symptoms, that's the best time to intervene and maybe we can head something off from becoming a bigger problem um, and, and stop it at the early stages. That's great. I want to thank you for being here on Valentine's Day. Thanks for having me. Day that's all about the heart. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah, happy Valentine's Day. So on behalf of Dr. Scott Fitel and myself, thank you for joining us. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them, and we'll do our best to follow up. Have a great day. Bye-bye.